begin with, it's a topic that I think is of absolutely critical importance to all of us here in New York and in other major cities. It impacts our daily life, our health, our global climate, and much more. But I'm doubly delighted to be welcoming you to this event because we're partnering with, an, with another institution, the German Consulate General, Consulate General here in New York, that has really become a, a wonderful and, and trusted friend in our, in our shared endeavor in, in leading to more environmentally sustainable uh, path. This is actually the fifth program that we've done together uh, with the Consulate General of Germany, and, and we're really thrilled to be able to share lessons on how jurisdictions in the United States and Germany are grappling with some of our shared challenges. So thank you very much for your continued support. Um, I'm also very pleased that we've been able to assemble such an expert group here tonight to discuss these issues. I won't provide in-depth biographies because I want to make the most of the time <coughs> available and we have them all printed out, but I will just briefly introduce them. Uh, starting off, we have a very special guest who's flown in all the way from Germany, Pro doc Professor Dr. Claudia Kempfert, who's head, Department Head of Energy, Transportation, and Environment at the German Institute for Economic Research. We also have Thomas Matek, Senior Lecturer in Environmental Health Sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health and Jen Robertson, Transportation Policy Advisor at the Ma New York City Mayor's Office on Sustainability. Um, just to provide a little bit of a roadmap of how the evening will be structured, Tom is going to provide start us off by providing an overview of the public health impacts of vehicular emissions and our reliance on car travel more generally. Then we'll turn it over to Professor Kempfert, who will give our keynote address on German municipal efforts to rein in vehicular emissions and shift to more sustainable modes. And finally, Jen will, will give us an overview of some of the exciting initiatives that New York City is pursuing in this regard. So in a moment, I'll hand things over to them, and of course, we'll have a Q&A, um, both led by myself and also provide an opportunity for your audience Q&A. Before I hand it over to our speakers, I would like to warmly welcome Jens <coughs> Janik, Deputy Consul General of New York, to provide a few Very much, Daniel. And by the way, I'm not the Consul General of New York, but the Consul Deputy Consul General of Germany. But I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Yeah. I would like to thank you all for for joining us tonight here for our talk, um, in curving cars, transatlantic dialogue on new urban mobility. First of all, special thanks to Danielle Spiegelfeld. A few years ago. She started this event series, um, Transatlantic Dialogue, together with my colleagues at the German Consulate General. Many of them have already left, so they don't remember the beginning of this series, but you remember that. The talks focused on issues like climate, sustainability, or energy efficiency, and have always been a very fruitful and meaningful exchange of opinions and ideas from both sides of the Atlantic. All over the world, societies are confronted with the same problems, either because they affect us globally, like the climate crisis, or because our lifestyle causes the same problems in different locations. The solutions for these problems will not be found in a small national context. Quite the contrary, our times call for a very strong international cooperation. Worldwide, our cities are growing bigger and bigger, Municipalities <laughs> are facing numerous challenges to adapt to a growing population. One problem is the increasing number of cars. There are various reasons for this, a struggling public transport system or the unavailability of local transit at all, the proximity to the next station, or sometimes it is simply about convenience. The result, be it in Berlin or New York, and I know many other cities where it's much worse than in these two cities I just named. Yeah. <clears throat> the result is all the same, too many cars. Additionally, the health effects are drastic and make it imperative for cities to act to protect their citizens. There is no one-size-fits-all solution to this problem. This is why events like tonight's are so important. It is my pleasure to welcome our three speakers. Some of them had a shorter journey than others, but as a German, please allow me to welcome, uh, to give a especially warm welcome to Professor Dr. Claudia Kempfert, head of the Department of Energy 
and Transportation and Environment at the German Institute of Economic Research, who came all the way from Berlin to us. The two other speakers will be introduced, I assume, by, by Daniel a little bit in detail, so I don't have to duplicate this. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very enlightening discussion, and I'm sure we will have one. Thank you very much. for hosting this event or sponsoring this event. It's very exciting for me to be here. Uh, the picture here on the left of the um, Magic Motorway is from the 1939 New York World's Fair. And um, that picture reflected sort of a vision of urban mobility in New York that uh, Robert Moses, who's a uh, very famous urban planner, official, um, he fought a, a battle about extending that vision uh, very close to where we are right now, uh, running Fifth Avenue through Washington Square Park. There's one such battle with Jane Jacobs, a, uh, an activist and a, sort of a citizen civil uh, urban planner uh, from Greenwich Village. And also on Broom Street, just a few blocks from here, where the uh, Lower Manhattan Expressway was proposed to be built uh, right across Lower Manhattan. So um, it's fitting that we're here. And uh, I want to just quickly give a very brief overview of air pollution and health. Uh, I'm going to use a New York City lens because I worked for several years for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on air pollution, starting with the Bloomberg administration during the um, development of Plan YC and the first uh, attempt to implement congestion pricing in New York back in 2007. I'm going to talk about the urban geography of exposure to air pollution in New York City, social disparities and the impact of air pollution. I will bring in somewhat the global dimension of the problem uh, because our air quality is actually quite good relative to many places. Um, and then uh, wrap up with uh, saying a few things about uh, the impact of cars on health and well-being beyond uh, both air quality and beyond uh, congestion pricing. So I hope you'll come away from these brief remarks uh, convinced that the problem of air pollution and uh, traffic is much more than about cars. The health impacts of cars are much more than about air pollution. And the solution to the health impacts of our dependence on private motor vehicles goes <coughs> well beyond congestion pricing. Okay, so uh, what are the common air pollutants that affect health directly as opposed to through uh, affecting the global climate system? The most important globally is uh, fine particles, PM2.5. That refers to the size of the particle. It's important because of its ability to penetrate deep into the lungs. PM2.5 is both a primary and a secondary pollutant. Black carbon is often a constituent of PM2.5. Ultra-fine particles are even much smaller, and we're exposed to them close to traffic sources. And then coarse particles, like from brake and tire wear. Gaseous pollutants, uh, nitrogen oxides, uh, <coughs> like NO2. Sulfur dioxide, thankfully, is not much of an issue in New York City anymore. Carbon monoxide also has been largely controlled. VOCs are important. Uh, volatile organic compounds because they contribute to other air pollutants, uh, including secondary PM and uh, ozone. It's important to remember that in the real world, um, even though some of these pollutants are part of what's called traffic pollution or tra traffic-related air pollution, that in the real world, especially in New York City, we're all exposed to a mix of both pollutant types and pollutant sources. In New York City, buildings are relatively more important source of all pollution compared to traffic uh, relative to other cities in the U.S. Um, our pollution in New York City comes both from local influences, which is what we usually think about when we think of traffic, but also distant 
uh, sources like Midwestern coal-fired power plants and regional sources. And then within the city, we have urban hot spots where the sources tend to cluster. Uh, even though when air pollution comes up in public meetings and public concerns, the focus is often on pediatric asthma, uh, air pollution is a systemic uh, toxicant. It causes systemic effects, inflammation, uh, and uh, other mechanisms affect virtually every organ system in the body, the cardiovascular system, uh, the respiratory system. Uh, air pollution is a human carcinogen. Uh, air pollution has now sh been shown to be a cause of diabetes and diabetes mortality. Um, it's well established to be a cause of low birth weight, but the uh, evidence is not yet there to incorporate that into the global burden of disease estimates. When we look at air pollution globally, most often people talk about deaths. It's the fifth leading cause of death globally. Most of those deaths are from air pollution are in low and middle income countries uh, like Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia. Um, most of the deaths from air pollution, the largest number of plurality are from cardiovascular disease, followed by chronic respiratory disease, respiratory infection like pediatric pneumonia and uh, diabetes and cancer. Okay, so in New York City, um, we're fortunate in having a air pollution program called the New York City Community Air Survey where we, we measure air pollution at many more locations than is typical in cities in the US and that program dates back to uh, 2008. So based on that monitoring, we're able to map air pollution at a neighborhood uh, level and really look at the spatial variation. And what we see is that for PM 2.5, the highest concentrations tend to be in the urban core of Manhattan and that's where emissions from buildings and mobile sources come together. But because PM 2.5 has an important regional component, emissions that cause particle formation outside New York City and wash over the city, the variability in PM 2.5 is much less from place to place than it is for nitrogen dioxide, which is a primary pollutant, it comes right out the tailpipe. Nitrogen dioxide commonly is used globally as a marker of traffic-related air pollution, even though it comes from basically all fuel combustion. So with traffic pollution, we see both the hot spot in the urban core, and we see the higher concentrations along some of the big uh, highways and arterial roads in the outer boroughs. Now, if we look at the portion of, P of PM 2.5, PM 2.5 is the most important pollutant for affecting public health. And now we use methods of emissions data and atmospheric modeling to apportion the amount of P PM 2.5 in the air in different parts of the city to the on-road mobile sources. What we see from that is that actually PM 2.5 from traffic has a different pattern and it tends to be, uh, have a higher contribution in places like the Bronx, northern Manhattan, um, and for our uh, guests who are not familiar with the geography of New York City, if you look at Manhattan and you see Central Park, um, you'll see on the, um, on the uh, east side of Central Park a very sharp uh, dividing line in terms of asthma uh, emergency department visit rates. So this is the separation between the Upper East Side, which is one of, one of the most affluent neighborhoods in the country, and East Harlem, which is uh, a relatively poor neighborhood. So we see health uh, susceptibility in terms of the prevalence of asthma and poor control of asthma is pr primarily a problem of low-income neighborhoods. And even though the worst air quality in New York is actually not in the high poverty neighborhoods, the biggest contribution from traffic pollution is in uh, these higher poverty neighborhoods within New York City. So then if we look at the impacts of air pollution uh, from traffic, PM from traffic on health, what we see is that <coughs> Uh, there are several hundred emergency department visits annually caused by uh, traffic-related PM. About 320 uh, premature deaths from traffic-related PM <coughs> in adults. Most of that comes from PM emitted by 
trucks and buses, not from cars. Um, so then looking at, well, why is there such a wide disparity in the health impacts of traffic pollution within New York City? It's due to two things. One is, as I pointed out, the exposure to PM from buses and trucks is relatively higher, maybe about 50% higher in the poorest neighborhoods compared to the most affluent neighborhoods in New York. But the susceptible population for having an asthma exacerbation from air pollution is much, much larger, much more uh, numerous in the low-income neighborhoods. So um, it is true that uh, asthma disparities in New York City are contributed to by air pollution, even though it's not true that the worst air quality in New York City is in the poorest neighborhoods. But for traffic-related air pollution, low-income neighborhoods are most impacted. Now, what are some of the solutions? I hope we'll be talking about this more in subsequent speakers and the Q&A um, to traffic-related air pollution exposure. How can we reduce um, the health impacts? Well, one exposure mitigation option is to separate people from traffic. Um, in New York City, and uh, during the first year of our <coughs> community air survey, it happened that Times Square was closed to vehicular traffic, and we had a monitor in Times Square. And we were able to observe that Times Square had been the highest NO2, had the highest NO2 concentration prior to this conversion, but just the process of moving the traffic away from that heavily um, traffic pedestrian area reduced the NO2 concentration in Times Square to be more similar to other parts of uh, Manhattan. Similarly, if you were to go out to a suburban community in Queens along the Long Island Expressway and measure NO2 at distances perpendicular to the LIE, what you would see is that the concentration falls off pretty substantially so that by the time you're about 200 meters away from the LIE, the traffic-related air pollution is about half compared to those who live much closer. So distancing people with pedestrian, uh, uh, pedestrian plazas and other uh, measures Cleaner vehicles, like low emission zones, uh, I think we'll hear more about that, and fewer vehicles, which is what congestion pricing is about. Even though the vehicles that we'll have fewer of may be uh, not the, the most polluting vehicles. OK, so just to, to wrap up, um, thinking more broadly about both traffic-related air pollution and the impact of motor vehicles on both the environment and on people. Um, if we think of the metropolitan area as being a, a system where people have to move from one part of the metropolitan area to the other, if we look at household per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Here's New York City. It's uh, kind of like the eye of a hurricane in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. The suburban communities around New York City have much higher per capita greenhouse gas emissions. So a climate action strategy that combines land use change and a transportation policy could serve a number of purposes for health and well-being. Now, it would reduce vehicle miles traveled, uh, air pollution, and greenhouse gas emissions. But it also would create a more efficient use of space to move people from place to place. It would, the amount of physical activity that people get, even people who take public transportation, everyone who takes public transportation walks or cycles as part of their trip um, because it doesn't go from your home to your destination typically. Uh, reduce crash risks. More affordable housing potentially could be created. And if we combine the cost of housing and transportation, vehicle costs, if more people could live in affordable housing near public transit, say regional rail stations, it would help to address our housing affordability crisis. These people would have more access to job services, and it's been shown that in sprawling metropolises in the U.S., there tends to be less economic mobility compared to compact ones because of people's ability to access uh, jobs and um, education. Mm -hmm. And finally, if, we're, if you're someone who's very concerned about conserving land for farming or for habitat or for watersheds, uh, 
where we live, even though it's somewhat counterintuitive, is actually uh, much greener than living in a suburban community where the roads chop up the habitat. There's actually more paved land per person than there is in New York City because of the way we live. So this compact urban development would have multiple benefits for both people and for the environment. And to really tackle the um, problem of cars, uh, I think we need to look at a more systematic approach. So finally, um, circling back to Robert Moses, uh, this is uh, Inwood, uh, near, right near uh, my home. Um, and this is Seeley, who became briefly a <laughs> local celebrity, a, um, a harbor seal who uh, has been hanging out. Uh, the Columbia football field is not far from there. The Columbia Boathouse is close. And this is uh, a bridge that Robert Moses built uh, to connect one of his uh, famous car-only parkways from the Bronx <laughs> to Manhattan. It's a beautiful bridge, um, but it was built in the 1930s before uh, people really were able to sort of fight back against the, um, the <coughs> vision of the car as the principal way of urban mobility. So thank you, and I look forward to uh, <laughs> everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks for the invitation. I'm really honored to come over from uh, Berlin to wonderful New York City and figuring out that uh, <coughs> we have almost the same difficulties in building clean cities. I'm cycling in Berlin, which is extremely dangerous. <laughs> I figured out cycling in New York is even more dangerous. <laughs> No, but that's, uh, that's an inspiration. I'm sincere since uh, Monday night, and the last two days I could watch and see uh, you have bicycle lanes, so which are green and separate, which is good. We don't have that in Berlin. We have some bicycle lanes, but uh, it could be more. But that's part of, part of, the, part of the solution uh, where we just um, heard that we have really a problem. Um, to solve not only climate policy but emission reduction in, in cities to make them more clean and that has health issues which is really really important. I would like to, to briefly highlight of the most recent study we did together uh, with the scientific advisory board to the German government where we highlighted especially this, uh, this issue and I'm, I'm pleased to, uh, to present also part of the work where um, me and my team and the team of the scientific advisory board um, that did a lot of did a, did a lot of work here. So just briefly highlight. Um, so why do we talk about um, curbing emissions? So air pollution. We just uh, we just heard is <coughs> one of the major problems. We got some some questions um, which we would like to address also in the Q and A the session later on. So my slides uh, particular. Uh, focus on, on the main issues um, here. So nitrogen uh, dioxide we already heard is uh, the particulate matter and this is uh, why we have um, European air quality standards uh, for the protecting the human health and you see here this is, these are the standards um, just a list uh, of, uh, of NO2 which is um, 40 uh, microgram per square meter on average uh, a year. And uh, we had a lot of debate in Germany about especially this, this value, but especially because we are exceeding in almost a large amount of cities, especially this value. And also part of the reason is that German car manufacturers uh, told us uh, they meet this target, but uh, yeah. you all know, you all know the, the true story. <laughs> <laughs> and that's part of the problem we, 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 we really have. And the other one, you, you already heard the, these numbers. We have 25 microgram <coughs> uh, for particulates uh, for, for the hour, um, for, for one year average on, on different hours measured. So this is, this is the European standard, and we should all meet this. Um, whether or not we do it, I just uh, briefly highlight. 
And um, here you see, this is uh, in Germany, the, the uh, particulates at uh, PM10 on the annual mean levels. Uh, this is a development since uh, 2000. Um, you see it goes a little bit down, um, especially in the rural background. This is uh, the, the, the green line. Uh, we have the yellow line, which is the urban background of the urban, uh, the urban traffic, as we already heard. It's, um, it's the largest one. Uh, it's going a little bit down, but it should be more steep. And that's, that's the main task that we have uh, in order to, to reach that. Now, um, the, uh, this is the NO2 level, also the development of the mean annual NO2 level uh, for these uh, three categories I just uh, presented. Um, between 2000 and 2015. This is quite flat, you see, um, it's not reducing in a way, uh, it's not, uh, it's exceeding also the, the numbers um, in, in most areas, which is um, a problem, we should, we should uh, take care of this. So, the annual limit level of 40 microgram per square meter um, for the NO2 is still exceeded in now um, 57 cities. So it has been much a uh, much larger number. So we had a lot of discussions the last two years. You've probably heard about it. Um, how to reduce in many more cities uh, the the um, the NO2 emissions to a larger extent. So we started with um, with uh, 96, and now we are f uh, 57. That's quite that's quite a success. Um, all politicians uh, tell us, um, although we as scientists, and we heard about it, the health impacts are crucial, recommend um, to decrease this number to zero. So we or should all meet um, uh, in every city at the, at the standards. Now, um, the source uh, we heard about already, uh, where does it come from? This is, uh, these are the numbers all for Germany. The sources for NO2 in, in cities. And here we, we see the part of the problem, which is vehicle traffic, of course, which is the largest amount of, uh, of sources. We have background, heating, industries, and so on, but um, the traffic is, and uh, vehicle traffic is uh, the source of the problem. So no excuses. We have to reduce it, or we have to fix it in a certain way, especially if we look at this number. These are the diesel cars, which are 72% uh, of Problem. So um, this is in Germany quite crucial, and you already know that um, the car manufacturers produce um, very much diesel car, many very many diesel cars, and like to produce many very diesel cars. So there's a, there's an issue here that politicians need to also force the car manufacturers to to get these numbers uh, right, and um, and also to reduce, of course, traffic and um, and bring alternatives on the street, especially like in cities of uh, Berlin or um, New York. So now uh, here we have the nitrogen dioxide emissions uh, of the diesel vehicles under world driving conditions. It's not the uh, the, the conditions the car manufacturers would like to, to show <laughs> us. And uh, here you see that's quite, I mean, this is a laboratory emission limit, and this is always the number I love to show. Uh, this is uh, the laboratory emission limit when you buy the car, they tell us this is a number. Mm -hmm. If you drive it, it looks much different. So mm -hmm. uh, you see all the different kind of cars. So you mm -hmm. see we have many European cars here, uh, starting from Renault. Uh, and Volkswagen and all the German car manufacturers of, uh, are part of it, uh, of, of the problem. But here you see that's, that's crucial. So we need to really reduce uh, the NO2 emissions, the nitro, nitrogen dioxide emissions, uh, quite drastically and get the, the car manufacturers to reduce that very, very soon and very, very drastically. So, and uh, the other part of the story we already heard about it is um, greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to reduce CO2 emissions as well. And uh, this is especially, these are the numbers again for Germany, um, uh, relevant because we are reducing emissions. This is the number here. So the starting point is 1990 and um, it has been reduced to a level of 75, uh, 73%. But you see here, this is the transport sector, which is the red line is going up. So that's not the right direction. It should go down. And this is why we uh, have two issues here. One is uh, the health impacts, but on the other hand, also climate change. 
Now, uh, if we look at the, um, we looked at the study on the different um, causes of uh, these uh, CO2 emissions, and we looked especially on the transportation sector. No, f uh, no flights uh, emissions are included here. It's just uh, uh, the traffic or the transportation uh, uh, on um, on uh, street and passenger transport. Rail freight uh, and rail freight mm -hmm. transport is um, is accounted here, and here you see it's 18 percent of total emissions in Germany are coming from the transportation sector, uh, where we think is, um, is also uh, one important part uh, why we should reduce. And here we have a cascade of, um, of emission reduction. The first thing is to reduce <coughs> transportation, to reduce traffic, so all the wasted uh, ways we are doing, uh, um, going with a car from A to B all the time. Uh, and without any reason, it's more healthy to go by bike or by foot uh, and reduce at uh, the first uh, stage the transport volume drastically to avoid unnecessary trips and just go on a more healthy way of uh, moving from A to B. Um, then the bundling of the individual transportation modes uh, and the next step would be also to shift uh, to rail of course, to move as much as you can, especially also transportation um, of goods uh, to rail and the next step is also energy efficiency and then if we have reduced the transportation uh, volume drastically um, to produce renewable energy as a fuel and also uh, use a more electric mobility in any case so it's rail but also uh, cars and vehicles which should be um, electric. So here we see the bike modes, uh, um, how many uh, people love biking, like many of us uh, in Germany, uh, in, in different cities in Germany. This is Berlin, which is 15%, which is not too bad, but it could be uh, more. Uh, here we have Germany, the landscape. Um, uh, it's in southern Germany, where we have se um, 10 to, to 11%. Um, and um, in other areas, for example, northern Germany, this is where I'm from, this is my home country, uh, my home city, it's 21% uh, 20, of, uh, of the people go, go by bike. And um, that's uh, quite interesting because it's a little bit increasing. So well, the more people bike, uh, the better. Uh, but of course, you need the, the right circumstances to do that. Now, um, we want also to talk about the measures, um, how, we can, uh, how we can solve the problem, how we can reduce the uh, negative uh, impacts in cities. And Germany reacted in different ways, so we didn't really manage to have a unified system to reduce emissions, and car manufacturers were not really able or willing uh, to reduce emissions uh, to, a, to a larger extent. So some city started in banning diesel cars. Uh, it's Hamburg on uh, two streets. Uh, that um, in some was uh, 2.3 kilometers um, that are just banned for old diesel cars. So there has been a debate whether this really reduces emissions because there's not really a check, it's a random check and uh, the evaluation will take place the end of this year. But uh, they already measured that the nitrogen emissions went down um, by 13% in that area. So uh, the, the discussion was about whether if we just close two streets, they move around to avoid the streets so we have even more traffic uh, uh, around the streets which are um, banned uh, from diesel cars, but it did not happen in that large extent. Now in Berlin, uh, the ban started in October 2000, it starts <coughs> in October 2019, so eight uh, stretches of roads, and some will be 2.9 kilometers, and here also random checks uh, will, will happen, so um, here uh, they try to reduce uh, the emissions uh, to in the most affected streets. In Darmstadt, which is a city in the, uh, more in the south of Germany, uh, the ban started in June 2019, um, and yeah, it was the same method and random checks. And Stuttgart is the most, I would say, interesting city. They, they had the largest problems with, with a lot of traffic, with a lot of emissions. And they started in January 2019 with cars and trucks. The old uh, diesel cars with Euro 4 norms are banned in the whole city. 
So that was quite uh, substantial. And there has been already a reduction of nitrogen dioxide emissions from 71 to 59 micrograms per uh, cubic meter air, and that's quite substantial. So um, it's interesting because Stuttgart is a city, it's a town of car manufacturers. Mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. In this city, it has a symbol to, to really, or the, it is a symbol to, to uh, move away these cars from the, from the whole city. Uh, in addition, I have to say, they also brought interesting public transportation modes into it, and um, the Stuttgart people like to bike as well, so, um, so it moves a little bit in the right direction. But it's, uh, it's symptomatic, uh, so if we can make it in Stuttgart, we can make it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, um, what has been done to reduce air pollution from traffic? That was one of the, the questions also for the discussions at, of tonight. Um, so the, the, there are different kind of, of options and uh, we recommended to have uh, different kind of measures uh, in place. First of all, the speed limit is crucial. Speed limit, I've seen here several speed limit um, um, way, uh, streets in, in New York as well. But I didn't really see that they are so um, limited. Uh, so I, I was not quite, quite sure whether how fixed or how strong this is measured, the speed limit. But in Germany, it would make sense really to reduce it. We have now 15 kilometers per hour, 50 kilometers per hour to reduce it to 30, um, especially in cities. Um, and we recommend greening and strengthening the pub public transport. So public transportation is crucial, of course, but also greening areas as well to improve the infrastructure for cycling as for of course pedestrians and um, driving vans for heavy duty vehicles I think that's also crucial because they should not move really into the center and um, the construction of road bypasses is also extremely important and um, also to, to make the streets less car friendly and to make it more bike friendly, more human being friendly, I would say, um, and that's uh, that's part of uh, how we can how we can solve it. And what in Germany happened is that we have some environmental zones. Um, so this here you can see the different areas where we have these environmental zones: Northern Westphalia, uh, in Baden-Württemberg, in the south, uh, where um, we have these uh, low emission zones, especially in cities, which we call Umweltzone. Uh, there are uh, only cars allowed to meet uh, modern emission standards, uh, very modern emission standards, and um, they have to get an environmental badge in order to move into this area. And uh, there are now uh, 58 zones in um, 61 cities that have this introduced so far. So that's quite, quite growing, and it's one part of, of the solution. Now, uh, we recommended to um, also the, the advisory board in this report to, to reduce the air pollution from, from traffic, um, especially uh, here you see, uh, oh, this is the environmental zone in, uh, oh sorry, this is the environmental zone in, in Berlin. Um, here is where I, I work, here, exactly there, in the middle. <laughs> And this is an environmental zone, of course, but the numbers here is quite large, uh, so there's um, um, an increasing emission level which we see. So uh, the streets where the diesel ban should happen is also here in the middle. Um, so you see this, uh, this quite substantial um, area. Now, um, this is uh, recommendations to reduce the air pollution uh, from, from traffic. And uh, you can see uh, we have uh, different kind of, uh, of measures uh, which we uh, recommended um, here. Uh, this is um, on the one hand um, the, um, the speed limit I already mentioned, but also um, a shift of the different modes of the transport and investment in uh, cycle friendly and pedestrian friendly infrastructure I already mentioned. And also what is really important is to have an attractive public transportation and the cost should be low. And for example, in Berlin, if you, go, if you go with a subway, and it's possible to go in a subway without a ticket. It's here, it's not possible because you have to buy it before, then you have to, to uh, zip it in and go in. But in Berlin, you can go into a, a subway without a ticket. If you are, if you are catched and <laughs> have to pay, you have to pay 60 euro. Uh, if that's the price you have to pay <coughs> if you're going uh, without a ticket. 
If you go by car into the center, park it somewhere and do not buy a parking ticket uh, and get cash, you pay 15 euro. <laughs> <laughs> so it should be the opposite. So it should be uh, 15 euro. I mean, th there should be lower prices, of course, for public transportation, one euro a day or so. Uh, but uh, the, the parking and the car should be much more expensive, especially parking in the center must be extremely expensive in order to avoid that the cars are going in. That's, well, that's one part of it. So that's, that's uh, the solution we are recommending. Okay, but I don't go through all of this. You, we can have the discussion later on. Time is running over. Uh, and we recommend it also to have a blue badge uh, for the nitrous uh, oxide emissions, for the NOx emissions, because this, these emissions should be reduced uh, also drastically. You can do that with a, with a regulated, in Germany regulated way of having a, a blue badge in addition to a green badge. Um, so that uh, only you are only allowed to drive into that area where the green badge is uh, is option. As I already said, no parking. I mean, <laughs> making parking really expensive. That's that's crucial. And in Germany, especially in, in Berlin, you have so many parking spaces. That's um, such a um, worthwhile. I mean, it, it's it's such a, an important place. You could use it for green fields. You could use it for bicycles. You could use it for for um, kindergartens, whatever, you could use it for any kind of interesting things, but not for cars. So that's, uh, that should be changed so to really to make it more expensive. And then it might be look, uh, look like this. So uh, we hope to have a more greener and more healthier city in the future. Thank you. over there come up. Um, my name is uh, Jen Roberton. I'm at the Mayor's Office of Sustainability here in New York. Uh, I'm a public servant that works on climate change mitigation for the city of New York. Uh, our main mandate is tracking greenhouse gas emissions citywide. So we do citywide uh, inventory for transportation, building, and waste emissions. Uh, we also track policy around mitigating climate change overall. Uh, I believe that climate change is an existential threat. It's why I do the work that I do, why I'm in the office that I'm in today. Um, I believe that the impacts from climate change, whether it be seeing more extreme storms or more extreme heat events, will impact those who are most marginalized, both locally and globally, first and, and most. Um, that's the reason why a lot of the, the information that Tom brought up earlier around air quality kind of overlays very well with how we're thinking of climate change. I, I really like how you pulled up that that graph from 80 by 50, our, our roadmap on meeting our climate change mitigation goals that showed that uh, there's nearly two times the PM 2.5 from transportation in low income areas in New York, and nine times the respiratory and asthma related hospitalizations and ER visits. That definitely, I think, overlays if we're going to see the greatest climate impacts as well in the city and, and globally, again, scaling it out. Climate change is a global <coughs> issue. We need radical reductions in greenhouse gas emissions in order to meet our Paris goals of 2.5 degrees of warming maximum, and we still are seeing warming. We're just trying to <laughs> mitigate as much as we can how much we're seeing, unfortunately, at this point. And we need to see radical changes within 10 years. We don't have a lot of time to, to get to where, where we need to be. So we need diversity of strategies, whether it be long-term land use changes to short-term adoption of new technologies in order to really be meeting our goals. And transportation, I, I work in transportation very specifically in, in my office. We need to see a 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector by 2050. Um, in order to do this, we need to have an 80% sustainable mode share by 2050. That looks like 80% of trips to New York in 2050 need to be on a bike, need to be walking or, or using the sidewalk in some way to get around, or need to be on transit. And within transit, we also need to see the electrification of MTA's buses. They have a 2040 goal to, to be all electric, and the city is definitely very much so in support of that. Uh, we need the remaining 20% of trips. Uh, realistically, we can't eliminate the car entirely by 2050. We, uh, the scale of our commercial operations in New York to run a city of 8 million people, of 4 million tourists a year, will need some vehicles. Uh, accessibility needs as well. Folks, uh, as I see my own family growing older in particular, there's more and more uh, trips in the car, um, as well as uh, people with disabilities. We know the vehicle will need to exist in some form, whether it be more efficient shared, hopefully also electric, zero emission vehicles is, is our office's mandate and portfolio, my own portfolio. 
Uh, and right now, today, we have a 64% sustainable mode share in, in New York. That's up from 62% last year. So we're seeing an increase in sustainable modes. We're seeing an increase in walking in particular. Walking is still the most used mode in New York. And part of that is land use. We have an incredibly dense city. 78% of the troops in Manhattan are walking. Manhattan's the densest part of the city. I think closer to 10 to 20%, probably closer to 10% in Staten Island, a much less dense area of the city where we see a lot more folks driving just due to the way that that borough is, is set up typology-wise. We need to create a car optional city. We need to electrify our freight logistics. We need to get people on transit and onto active modes. And again, land use is key here to making that all happen. We see most of our transportation emissions outside of Manhattan. So 80% of the carbon emissions in New York that contribute to uh, climate change within the transportation portfolio are trips that begin and end in the outer boroughs. We're not seeing a lot of traffic happening in, in Manhattan relative to the, the scale of the city. So I focus on electric mobility. I work at the micromobility scale, so pedal assist bikes, cargo bikes, that sort of stuff, up to freight logistics. Uh, a few projects that I'll touch upon now. I do want to get to the Q&A and, and the panel since I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say about this. Um, but in terms of EV infrastructure, we're right now working on getting access to electric vehicle fast charging in all five boroughs. <coughs> Uh, we have uh, a drift of charging access in the Bronx and Staten Island. There's actually the least number of chargers there, and the most number of chargers in Manhattan, where they make the least sense to, <laughs> to be. And a lot of that has to do with income, has to do if I'm a private business, I'm looking at work and, and make money, which is how, how that works, which is why the city is going forward and saying, hey, we want to make sure that people in, in the boroughs are adopting EV, or maybe hopping on a, a train isn't as easy. Uh, we also have a, a grant right now through the U.S. Department of Energy. It's, it's New York, it's Seattle, City of Seattle, uh, City and County of Denver, and Fourth Mobility based out of Portland. In each city, we have our own version of electrifying shared mobility. There's some folks working more on car share. Uh, our focus is actually on the for hire vehicle sector, which uh, is really interesting right now. A lot of movements happening right now in New York around that. Uh, we recently passed or extended the cap on new for hire vehicle licenses. The for hire vehicle fleet tripled. Um, with the advent of office companies in New York, we're up to uh, roughly 180,000 for hire vehicles in New York. Uh, our, our office tracked that greenhouse gas emissions in the for hire vehicle sector went, went up 62% between 2013 and 2018. That's, that's a huge jump. I mean, that's incredible. Um, so definitely trying to mitigate that by, I mean, the, the best way to mitigate that is to remove the number of vehicles or cap the number of vehicles being added on. But if there is some natural attrition happening to the fleet already, we want some of those vehicles to be replaced by electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. That's going to help us make the business case for charging to get some of these freight operators to, to hop on electric as well. Uh, so we're installing six chargers for, to support that. Um, we are doing a level two curbside pilot. So we're working with Con Edison, the, the utility company. They're, they're funding this. On the curb, you'll see 100 parking spots in New York with a, a level two charging pedestal, which charges a car in around four to six hours. And we're exploring right now how we compare that to some of our shared mobility and, uh, and loading some projects with, uh, with more to come on that. Um, we also have an open RFEI right now through the Economic Development Commission, um, EDC. This is building on the clean trucks plan that came out last year. So we're right now leveraging our freight real estate or ports uh, to ask people, uh, house vendors, hey, here's our real estate. How are you going to help us get electric trucks here? If you're using our land, how can we get to uh, zero emission freight and low emission freight? I'm really excited about uh, cargo bikes right now. Um, our, our DOT is also working right now with three vendors around helping them do last mile deliveries using a, an e-assist bike. Um, and we have current uh, uh, kind of open conversations on that with more to come as well. And uh, tracking micro-mobility ledge, I know that uh, a lot of folks here probably have been following what's happening at the state level around that, so we're tracking that and hoping to get a bill signed at some point and moving forward from there on the state level. Uh, and also tracking uh, CAFE standards. That presentation from, uh, uh, from Claudia reminded me of uh, our, our letters on the CAFE standard rollback in New York City's involvement and support around California's current um, legal action against the CAFE standard rollback. So that's like a sweeping uh, kind of cliff notes of what we've been up to in New York, um, kind of building upon a lot of the stuff uh, my counterparts here on, on, uh, on this panel. But I think now I'd like to hand it over to Danielle maybe and get the conversation started. Thank you so much. CAFE is that corporate average on standards. It's the efficiency standards for the car engines. Well, thank you all. Those were really fantastic and, and very enlightening presentations. Um, I will, I'll start off the Q&A by just trying to get at a few of these 
transatlantic lessons, so to speak, um, and exchanges of knowledge that, that we might find particularly useful comparisons between what's happening in the two jurisdictions. And I'll, I'll start where you began, um, Claudia, and talking about bikes. Um, you admired our bike lanes, and we've done a lot to, to improve them uh, under this administration and the past administration as well, and we're quite grateful for that. And yet, biking as a mode share here is well below what it is in Berlin and many of the other cities that you described. I think, and Jen, correct me if I'm wrong, about 1% of the population commutes via bike in New York. Is that correct? 1.1, as of the most recent number. 1.1. 1.1 trips. I wasn't sure if you're, I don't know if that's the number of trips or number of people. Or even number, uh, of, number of people. Number of people, yeah. Or is it the number of trips? Number of trips, yeah. okay. So, so but yeah, probably at 18%, where there's probably still quite a spread. So I'm curious if you, have any insight into what has contributed to the to the substantial rise? Because I also noticed that it went from about eight percent or eight or nine percent up to fifteen in a matter of ten years. So, so what do you attribute that success? Well, um, one one part of of, uh, of the success comes from the bike lanes, that, which has been improved, and that's that's uh, one one part of it. Um, that you have to have safe bike lanes, and safe means really separate from the car lane and um, uh, as, as, um, as separate as possible, of course, but uh, still in, in, in Berlin, for example, the cars are still preferred. I mean, we had a lot of space, we have a lot of streets and it's full of cars and it makes it, um, makes it difficult, but um, um, more people lo would love to bike. I mean, the polls show that more people would love to bike. Um, but um, the, the bike lanes are not um, sophisticated enough. They are not safe enough. So, so um, that's important also to um, to work on that. And um, I've looked up the, the numbers. Uh, in Berlin, um, we have a motorized private transport, which is 42% still, and public transport is uh, 43. So that's that's the mode share uh, we we see in um, we see in Berlin. In Berlin, we have the luxury really to have a very excellent public transportation system, which has been grown over the last uh, decades. But um, biking is much more healthy, and uh, in, in the in the middle of this of the city, as you described, in Manhattan, uh, the people walk, and uh, but here also the the pedestrian streets need to improve um, as well. Uh, and, uh, but I think part of the solution is really one thing is to make bike lanes more safe. On the other hand is to uh, reduce the preferences for cars, to have a stronger speed limit, less parking spaces, more costly parking spaces, and less attractive um, ways of going into the city with a car. And that, that's the two, two parts of the story, I would say. Uh, does anyone want to add anything or do you want to? So that, that, that's super interesting. I know that we have plans of adding a minimum of 30 miles of protected bike lanes a year. That's just, just a minimum, but we're hoping to exceed beyond that. And, um, I, I bike most of the time. I get to yeah. and from work biking. I, I take the tram up and going longer distances when I'm going out at night. Um, I'll sometimes city bike in and yeah. take the train back. I know we're definitely a transit city in, in a lot of ways. Um, where I'm most interested right now in New York is a lot of our for hire vehicle trips are two miles or less. So that for me is an incredible opportunity to get people on bikes. That makes a lot of sense for folks who aren't going long distances, especially in the warmer weather, if, if they're able to, to hop on a bike share or a, a folding bike or their own personal bike, that's really where I, I see opportunity in New York. Um, that's true. Now, I, I forgot the, the shared bike systems, you're, you're right. I mean, they are growing and growing everywhere. We have now um, the e-scooter e problem. Um, um, we have an e-scooter problem in, in Berlin. I don't know whether you have it here. I didn't see them. They are it's all the way. <laughs> oh, right. They are everywhere, and lying on the street, lying on pedestrian areas, uh, everywhere. It's like uh, it's like crazy, and the people are using it like crazy. I mean, there was two people on an e-scooter without a helmet and running through the middle of Berlin. I mean, even biking is very dangerous, but that's really dangerous. And so, they, but they are, they are booming, of course, and they are now discussing how to control it. Yeah. But the sharing system are increasing. Well, that, that actually anticipates one of the questions that I was going to ask. So New York City uh, is going to permit 
e-scooters, not in Manhattan, as I understand, but in the outer boroughs. And so I, I think we've seen all over the US similar problems. There was a great article on San Diego's trouble with e-scooters today in the Times, similar problem, just streets littered with them. And so that brings up the question of what's the way to regulate this, right? I mean, it, there's something quite attractive about allowing the private sector to come in and to compete for providing this service and having a variety of different providers as opposed to just sort of, you know, giving a more controlled sort of monopoly franchise. Um, but then it introduces this problem of having an abundance, right? And, and the sort of scooter litter and whatnot. And so I'm curious whether any of you, if there, are there German cities that have gotten it right or seem to get it right? How is New York thinking about this problem, building on the experience, you know, we're coming a little behind some of the other cities? I welcome any thoughts. Just for clarity on the on the process there, so there's a bill that was passed by the Assembly and the Senate that would offer uh, legalization statewide of uh, throttle e-bikes and of e-scooters. Um, there's a lead time, I forget the exact dates, so don't call me on this, there's I think 180 days for the throttle bikes, maybe 200 or so days for the, the scooters. Um, that would also not allow a scooter share, so those line bikes, those uh, uh, bird bu those birds, uh, scooters, not bikes, pardon me, the, the lime scooters and the the bird scooters would not be allowed as a scooter share in, in Manhattan, but a private scooter would be allowed. Um, that bill has not yet been signed by the governor. Uh, and once that is signed and the bill is put into effect, then New York, uh, New York City would then have to revisit a local law that bans the same scooters and throttle e-bikes. So we have city council movement that has to happen as well uh, during that 180 or so day lead times to offer clarity on that. Thank you for that. Well, in Berlin, they are now discussing how to solve it. I mean, the, this is really obviously a big problem, and they are now trying to regulate it in a certain way. First of all, to decide whether you need a helmet or not, because we had heavy injuries with it. So they are going on the, on the pedestrian area, and they are going on the street, they are going on the bike lane, they are going everywhere, and uh, they are full. Uh, it's really full of e-scooters everywhere, and uh, so they are heavy, heavy... Um, heavy injuries as, as well with this and they want to regulate it in a certain way um, but uh, they are very popular so we will see what's going on next so, but there's no regulation yet yeah <coughs> I just wanted to add um, <coughs> one perspective on the uh, the e-scooter or the uh, fr more frictionless mobility and that is that I think if anyone who's traveled around the world or even around New York City who has had the experience of saying, wow, this is a great neighborhood, this is a great street, I really want to come back here. It's because of people who are uh, lots of pedestrian traffic and things to do moving at that speed. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, that's the way that people get physical activity. It's, uh, you know, there's good data now to show people taking public transit that combines active mobility or people who get active mobility uh, by cycling or walking every day that has tremendous health benefits. So I do think, I understand there will be situations where for time or convenience um, that, you know, speeding up the last uh, leg of your trip will be helpful. But I also think we need to um, encourage a different way of thinking about mobility and uh, accept that that friction, just like you, know, you go to the gym, you dial up the friction on the bike or the soul cycle or whatever, you're getting exercise. So if we take all of the friction out of the commute, we're, we're removing the most uh, healthy part, both for neighborhoods and for people of getting around the city. Definitely, I agree on that point. Um, I know that during the previous administration, there was an, an active transp uh, transportation design guideline that looked at how do we get people to walk up the stairs, for example, very basic stuff that I thought was very interesting. Uh, I mean, on the flip side, and I, I mean, and I don't think that I can speak with, uh, with certainty around my office's position on this at, at this stage, we're still evolving on our end, but I did read in Portland, they had a, an e-scooter pilot program, and they found that 30% of the trips that took place on these scooters would have otherwise been on a vehicle. Mm -hmm. So that for me is compelling. Like, how do we get people not to displace walking trips? Like, to, to your point exactly, we don't want people to not walk around, but what does that look like for that last mile for, for whatever reason someone's hopping on a scooter instead? I want to learn more about that. It's, it's intriguing. I have to just say on the point about uh, encouraging stair walking, for a long time here we've had signs that say burn calories, not electricity in the elevators. And I find it, find it quite effective on the way up to get cookies here. Um, so <laughs> if I want to try that nationwide. <laughs> but uh, you know, more seriously, on, on this, the subject about the imperfection of electric uh, solutions, uh, one of the points that I think is really notable about the presentation you gave, Tom, is, is the multiple ways in which um, cars and trucks contribute to particulate matter. 
Um, and so I was wondering if you could provide a little bit of insight into for us as to sort of what share of emissions from PM comes from tailpipe emissions and therefore would be you know, mitigated largely, not entirely, but largely by electrification and what share is coming from merely the act of, of traveling, putting these heavy vehicles on the road? Yeah, so uh, there isn't a simple answer to that question. It turns out that this is um, one of these it depends answers and it's under active research. But uh, the simplest answer is it's a substantial proportion of the particle pollution that's produced by any motor vehicle comes from brake and tire wear and also resuspension of road dust. Um, now, electric vehicles eliminate all of the gaseous pollutants uh, that contribute to secondary particulate and ozone, so that's good. Uh, they're also more, much more energy efficient, so they're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, especially if the uh, grid is, uh, if they're recharging with a low carbon source. Um, but uh, what we do know is that the more stop and go traffic there is, the more brake and tire wear particulate emissions there'll be, and exhaust emissions if it's an internal combustion vehicle. Uh, and also, the larger the vehicle, the heavier the vehicle, the more brake and tire emissions. So electric vehicles do tend to be heavier, and nowadays mm -hmm. we're seeing more and more uh, SUVs um, on the road, which has all kinds of implications for safety and for emissions. So. Um, I, the short answer is I think uh, we shouldn't, uh, just reducing the tailpipe emissions is not a good reason to uh, switch to uh, invest heavily in electric vehicles, electric cars I would say. We have to have freight delivery. We have to have public transit in a city as big as New York. And we already have a very old school electric vehicle technology and that's our subway. And so, um, you know, that's where I think really the emphasis needs to be on improving the sustainability of our trans transportation. Yeah, I'll just add, I agree 100%, and I think that really speaks to why having researchers and consultants that are experts on this is so important for, for me, because I take all that information in and, and go forward of what is the best available technology today to address climate change, and how do we move forward on freight logistics, on electrifying buses, so on and so forth. Getting people out of cars most definitely is priority, not only because of uh, climate change mitigation and air quality, but congestion. I mean, we had an average of four miles per hour in Midtown as the average speed last year, November, December. And a lot of that had to do with the increase in prior vehicles, and we are currently crafting and putting forward policy to address that. It has to do with uh, an increase of private vehicle use. We know that a lot of our uh, registration data shows that car ownership is going up in the city. You want to address that through car share and other, other ways getting people around. But by and large, you need people walking, biking, and on transit as much as possible. Um, that's the way we're going to get to all of our, our quality emissions reduction and congestion goals overall. Mm -hmm. I, I would completely agree because um, we, we have to, to look for as less um, individual vehicle emissions as possible, especially in urban areas and electric cars. Electric vehicles are one part uh, especially interesting for the freight <coughs> transportation. E-commerce, we will talk about this, all this. Um, if, you, if you have to have some kind of individual mobility um, undertaken, then electric vehicles are much better than the combustion ones. Um, but try to avoid as many cars, as many trips as possible. Get the people out of the cars, get them into the, uh, into public transportation, on, on the foot, on the bike. That's that's the first thing, but uh, the, the unavoidable, unavoidable traffic and individual vehicle transportation is better with the electric cars with renewable energy, um, and that's that's one one part of uh, one part of the solution. I would completely agree. So your your point about e-commerce raises another question that I had. Um, I think there's often a debate in sustainability circles, and I'm not sure if there is a good answer. I, I hope that you know a bit more about this than I do, the state of the science on this. But you know the environmental impact of the transition towards an e-commerce. Uh, economy. There are avoided trips, of course, from the individual perspective, avoided trips to the store and whatnot, but there must be a lot of uh, additional trips and additional freight trips as well, especially the further you get from this from the urban core. And so I'm, I'm wondering if anyone on the panel has information into the share of truck travel or vehicle travel in urban centers that is attributable to e-commerce 
Um, and if there are any steps or even sort of ideas of steps that might be taken to regulate uh, this industry. And because I got your question in advance, <laughs> I looked that up um, for Germany especially, and um, there are recent numbers showing that 20% um, of CO2 emissions of cities um, are uh, coming from e-commerce um, on one third of urban traffic. And between 2000 and 2017, uh, the volumes of Korea Express and parcel services has doubled in Germany. So um, that's basically because of e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a number which is, um, yeah, not, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's, it's challenging, let's say it that way, um, because um, here we have to find uh, solutions and in, in how to reorganize that. So uh, one part of the solution, as we just discussed, is electrification. So the electric vehicles is, is one, is important here. and. Um, but also to, to find ways and really not having that increase, deep increase of e-commerce in the future anymore. I don't know how, whether this is feasible, but um, um, questionable how, uh, how we can uh, solve that. But in, in Germany is booming and booming. And I'm not quite sure whether let's see it the same or do you have already um, a slower curve reach. Yeah, I, I only have the residence uh, curb view of the problem, and, and I see it just a huge increase in the number of uh, uh, trucks, delivery trucks. The postal service has really gotten a shot in the arm from uh, the business from Amazon. I mean, I think if we really look at it broadly, I think there are issues related to packaging and the embedded carbon emissions in packaging. There's consumption uh, patterns that are driven by this sort of frictionless e-commerce. <coughs> just anecdotally talking to friends, they say, well, I order things, and what I've realized is if I don't like it uh, and I just complain, mm. uh, they don't even want it back. They just toss it out. So um, you know, I think there's an opportunity. I don't know what the levers are that a city has, but potentially to require some kind of transparency and accounting. Uh, Amazon, I'm sure, can quickly compile the data on vehicle miles, on emissions, on carbon emissions uh, in the uh, cardboard boxes that maybe have like a pen in the box. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I think if we really look at this comprehensively, and the other point, I, I don't want to sound too old school, even though I am old school. You know, again, like taking that friction out of the shopping experience is another way of draining the life and vitality from urban communities. I mean, I know there are other things that we go to neighborhoods for, for restaurants and coffee and so forth, but um, if everyone's staying home and getting Uber Eats or the Amazon deliveries, and you know, what does that do to our neighborhoods? So um, I, I don't have an answer to that question, but I'm concerned about it. Uh, I know that in New York City, we have 160,000 trucks that cross our boundaries every day. Um, I can't tell you what share of that is e-commerce versus food delivery, um, getting our grocery stores filled, so and so forth, but that's, that's the step that we have. We do know that 45% of New Yorkers get at least one delivery a week. Uh, I know anecdotally as well, walking into my apartment lobby, I see the, the pile of boxes. I don't know if other folks have that experience of seeing the, the boxes. Sometimes they stay there for days. I guess whatever someone ordered wasn't that important to them in the first place. <laughs> um, we definitely see, see a lot of that. Walking around Manhattan, too, you do see the pile of boxes also on the curb now, which is also an interesting development that, that we're also uh, tracking on our own end. Um, to add to, to what you said around electrification, I mean, it's not only electrifying the vehicle, but also making the vehicle smaller. Mm -hmm. um, we do in New York City, we don't have the ability to do a low emission zone like, like you do in, in Germany, unfortunately. It's a, a, st a state and federal preemption issue. Um, but we do have the ability to regulate the size and weight of a vehicle. So we can say, you know, we want only uh, a smaller delivery vehicle in, in this area. We do have designated truck routes, and we do have enforcement strategies to make sure that trucks are, are following them. Uh, we, in particular, can tell when they hit our bridges, a bridge strike so good issue in, in New York City. Uh, we also are working right now on lockers. So let's say that uh, the repeat delivery issue is something that the freight providers, the parcel delivery providers have reached out to us on. If they come back to the same residence over and over again, not only is it a congestion issue, an emissions issue, an air quality issue, but from their end, where, where a lot of their interest is, it becomes commercially problematic when they're wasting money going to the same place again and again. So we can at least be aligned that this doesn't make a lot of sense on, on all these fronts. 
Um, so how do we get people to get their package into a locker? Maybe they get a code on their smartphone and they unlock it that way as well. So that's another strategy. Um, and the, the cargo bikes, I mean, this is an area that Europe is, is a leader in. We're looking towards a lot of our, our counterparts there around how do we make that last mile as compact and as sustainable as possible. That's, I think, an area for innovation. So I just want to ask a couple more questions before I hand it over to the audience. Um, one concerns congestion pricing. So New York City uh, is about to join a handful of cities around the world in implementing a congestion pricing scheme. And I'm curious as to how the prospect of congestion pricing is affecting the way that the city is thinking about its transportation strategy and its strategy of further encouraging um, a mode shift off cars. And then from the German perspective, I'm curious, I'm not aware, if, correct me if I'm wrong, of any German cities that have congestion pricing, do they? Why not? Has that been something that's been on the table? Is it something you would support? Um, in what circumstances might it become relevant for Germany? Before you answer, I have a question to you, because I just drove in with a taxi uh, from the airport, and um, there has been on the screen the information, now you pay congestion price. Mm -hmm. Is that what we are talking about? Uh, just for curiosity, <laughs> yeah. probably you can explain it. No, that, that's a really good question. So we have um, several congestion pricing mechanisms at play right now. We have uh, what you're speaking to, which is a New York State. Were you on a yellow cab by chance? Yeah. yeah, so there's a New York State surcharge, which goes towards um, transit infrastructure, so on and so forth. It's, I believe, 2 point something percent or, or other. I can't remember the exact number right now. Um, but that is a New York State program that is a, a surcharge on the yellow cabs. We also have another congestion uh, mitigation strategy for the app base for hire vehicles, the Ubers and Lyfts, so and so forth, uh, which basically says if you're in Manhattan south of 60th Street, you can't have your vehicle be empty if a passenger more than 31% of the time. Mm -hmm. They spend a lot of time, I mean, these, these companies when they first launched basically got a lot of drivers out there, flooded the market for a lot of vehicles that way. If I'm on my phone and I'm, I'm leaving somewhere um, uh, late at night, I want to hop on a, on, hop on a train, I want to hop in a car, I get a car in maybe a minute as opposed to five or ten minutes. Uh, but for the drivers, they're driving around empty waiting for someone to, to ping them and waiting for maybe a bunch of people to, to leave a, a concert or an establishment at the same time. But they're wandering around empty, not making any money on their end. What's and, the surcharge? Uh, the, the surcharge is, this is a utilization standard. Yeah, so basically if you, um, for the New York State, uh, I can, for the, for the taxes, I can find that. I think it's 2.5%, 2, 2 but I'm not 100% sure. The surcharge is $2.5 on for a yellow cab in the zone. $2.75 for an Uber or Lyft in the zone, and that's separate from the utilization, which is beginning and is not yet fully in place. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate that. Well, in the, in the card, they said $2.5 on the So the yellow, the yellow cab, yeah. And the yellow cab when I came in from the airport to, to here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that's uh, separate from, so right now we can't, we basically are looking at limiting the amount of time that for hire vehicles are empty in, in Manhattan, and that's separate, and you know, I'm kind of trailing on here, is separate from congestion pricing, which is a tolling program that will charge vehicles entering Manhattan. So then, how are you thinking about the impact of congestion pricing on your plans to, to mode shift? Is it impacting your plans at all? It's a tremendous opportunity. I mean, for funding transit and getting people out of cars, that I think is where we need to be. And uh, from the German perspective on congestion pricing? There is no congestion pricing at all. So the infrastructure payment is basically based on energy taxes and um, infrastructure uh, payments are not from, from the congestion uh, price. Um, we had looked that into carefully also into a city tax, which is now discussed in Berlin. And um, But the city tax is just a fixed price. It's not a congestion price. So I understood that you use this also as a method to control congestion, which to my opinion makes very much sense. But um, in Germany we don't have that. So it's just a financial goal. If they want to have a city tax, they want to create more uh, income uh, for infrastructure and all the other costs they have. But to our opinion, it would make more, se more sense to really have a distance-based um, toll. Uh, so you can really or the polluter pays principle is important that you pay for the trip you want to make the the if you want to go on streets which are highly uh, congested you have to pay a larger amount than just um, a fixed city tax which is now under discussion in Germany there is no I mean almost no discussion on this distant based uh, toll 
to control for pollution um, now for Berlin the city tax and uh, because we have the, uh, the other instruments I just mentioned the speed limit we have the environmental zones um, we have other measures like bike lanes and um, higher cost for parking and lower cost for public transportation all the, the individual measures really to get the traffic out of this the city um, but the next step would be also to to go for this system based tolls but in Germany it would make sense to have a unified uh, system not in each city an individual price um, and, and an individual system because because of data protection there's a huge discussion how you how you really deal with this so we have more uh, difficult laws than, than in the US, I understood. They really mm -hmm. to, if you want to control for the individual trips, it's really difficult to get it in line with the, with the data uh, protection laws we have uh, in Germany. Mm -hmm. But to find any kind of in-between solution um, w would be our recommendation and uh, include congestion as one part of it. And, and Tom, as was just mentioned, a, a part of the goal or a large part of the goal of the New York congestion scheme is not necessarily to eliminate the number of cars or substantially reduce it, but to shift the demand, right? Because the, the price should, should presumably vary um, such that it's lower at off-peak times. And so my question from an air quality perspective or from a health perspective, is there a substantial benefit to dispersing the same amount of pollution over a longer period of time? I mean, is the, are these sort of threshold pollutants from a health perspective, or is it, or is it more of an aggregate? Um, I think, it, to the extent there will be a benefit from that time shifting, it will be because the uh, inter, the uh, coincidence of people on the street and congested traffic will tend to be less. So if you walk around Manhattan. You know, as it happens, our busiest streets for pedestrians also tend to be our busiest streets for mm -hmm. traffic. If we could have traffic that's flowing better, uh, it will help some. But as I pointed out in my talk, a big part of the uh, traffic pollution in New York City is outside of the Central Business District, um, and it's um, trucks and buses. So that will be helped to the extent that the buses are moving better, uh, that will help. Mm -hmm. um, I do think we need, from a from like a health and an equity point of view, to think about how to improve bus transit in the parts of the city that are less well served by subways, which happens to be, uh, if I'm at home in northern Manhattan and going across the Bronx from mm. west to east, people really use the bus service and the buses are bogged down in traffic and the congestion charge won't help that. Potentially, even it could uh, make things worse if people are doing sort of a cruise and park and ride. Now, I understand that there's uh, some consideration of residential parking permits. Maybe Mr. Kromoff, you know more about that. Um, there's certainly, that was a concern when congestion pricing came up uh, uh, 12 years ago, that there would be people parking and uh, or cruising to park outside the congestion zone, hopping on the subway. That definitely happens mm -hmm. in my neighborhood now. I don't mm -hmm. know whether it would be made worse by congestion pricing, but I would be concerned about it. Um, and if I could just get circle back to the bike issue, I do think there's potential for some uh, alliances between cyclists and car-owning uh, New Yorkers. I don't own a car, although I have for most of my life. But I know people who live in my neighborhood who need to have a car and having a residential permit system, which every other large city in the Northeast has, seems like something that New York City should have, and might be a way to free up some of the parking that people go berserk about when you put in a bike lane or a city bike, and get the car-owning, car-dependent New Yorkers, of which are still many, uh, in an alliance with the cyclists. Um, that's just my modest proposal. Thank you for that. All right, so with that, I'll open it up to questions. Charles, since you, you've been sort of mentioned several times, I'll start with you. Charles is a, is a noted economist and transportation expert. So. Um, thanks. I'm going to pass on the art residential parking permit. But thank you. <laughs> Jen, my question is for you. Um, it's kind of a tough question. We have 28 months left with a mayor who demonstrably has little or no interest in being mayor anymore <laughs> and, and who has never uh, understood and um, internalized the livable streets idea, and the idea of curbing cars. And he's had to be hounded 
uh, into any of the handful of times that he stood up to a community board that got in the way of a bike lane or a bus lane. He's had to be hounded, and in fact has really done nothing to turn around the, the NYPD who are so anti-pedestrian and anti-bike, and that's part of the equation. Um, and he himself, he's not a role model, but we know all that. So what do we do in the next 28 months as concerned citizens? What can we do to advance an agenda of equitable transportation and curbing cars and livable streets? Thank you for, for your comment. I, I think that the, the biggest support that we need right now is folks like the, the folks in the room right now to show up at community board meetings and I get in there and getting yelled at. I'd be appreciative for folks to actually come uh, who aren't the same the same folks there that are there every time. I think that having you know if your spreadsheet, I've used many a time to, to tinker around with around some of the policy that, that we're pushing for in sustainability. I, I'm a, a small peon in the in the kind of big machine here trying to do my part as well, but I think that we're all in this together. Climate change is going to be, I think, the, the biggest threat for, for all of us, and I think that hope everyone in this room is out there voting, out there engaging their communities, trying to push forward <coughs> and trying to be trying to be vocal on what they want to what they want to see happen. Um, I'm a bit constrained on what I can say, but that's where, where I'm at. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Gabriel, to start. Uh, thank you for an excellent discussion. Uh, we heard a lot about taxes and regulations. I was wondering if we can achieve some of the things, especially towards the two extremes. In other words, uh, incentives, rather than taxes and regulations, so incentives that the local city governments can put in there for the two approaches. One, for the individual to be more friction prone, if you will, in terms of walking, in terms of bike, <coughs> possibly in terms of scooters under control. But more importantly, the other extreme, which is the mass transit, electric vehicles and delivery trucks, and mass transit buses in the neighborhoods that have to be. Years ago, I don't know if it's still in effect, employers used to get credits for use of mass transit. That vehicle can be used very easily for electric mass transit above board for buses and also for school buses be electrified, which finally is starting to get debated in Congress and the Senate. I was wondering if you can both talk from Germany's point of view, as well as New York City's point of view, what can be done in terms of incentives for those two extremes, rather than the individual car owner? Um, I'm going to come at the question a little indirectly, which is to use uh, a lesson I learned from colleagues who are vital strategies working on tobacco control. And one of the things that the tobacco control community learned is that appeals to the public, we do, we do need to change public perception and public opinion because political leaders are um, our governor or mayor, they are um, by and large um, you know, responding to public perception and public attitude. So what the tobacco control people learned is that these kind of rational, data-driven, you know, engineering, uh, health science arguments did not make a difference in the attitudes about smoking. It was gut punch, emotional, intuitive appeal. And a lot of the things that we're talking about, I mean, I, you know, read stuff that Mr. Komaroff writes and the urban planners, the transportation experts, it's really interesting. And it really appeals to sort of a system thinker. But to the average member of the public, these are very counterintuitive ideas that we can move more people if we take away car lanes. They don't get it, <laughs> honestly. So I think we need to come up with very much more creative, emotional communication strategies. We need to be uh, talking up. I mean, the MTA, I think, is you know should have a green brand. Yeah. You know, Andy Biker is, <laughs> has the most important green job in New York City, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, so we need to get people to think about, you know, taking public transit, walking as doing their part, you know, for the city and for being green. But, and we need to get away from something that I think is an unfortunate trend, this sort of tribalism within the sustainable mobility community. Um, I, I consider myself kind of like a scaredy cat uh, bike rider, you know, if, I'm, if I can find a bike path. My wife, Debbie, and I, we sold our bikes because we couldn't find enough safe, comfortable biking opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think 
the idea of like the war on cars. I don't think we're going to win a war on cars. I think we need we need to get alliances. Bus riders are really an overlooked. They're more low income. They're older. It's a pretty accessible system. <coughs> people do get on the bus in a wheelchair. I think bus buses are the fastest way to move people out of cars in large numbers. If the bus service could really be improved. Anyway, that's a long-winded answer of saying I think we need to work on public perception and, and shaping the public opinion about the issue that we haven't done. Before. With all due respect, communication is great, but money talks. If you give a discount mm. yes. to the green MTA brand for an electric bus, yes. it will be used as opposed to advertising that people may or may not pay attention to. Right. So it's the opposite of regulation. It's Instead yeah. of negative regulation and negative taxes, I'm suggesting positive reinforcement with a discount to be able to reinforce the idea. And not just for that, but also for bikes and for... So, so due to a certain German company, uh, we have a lot of funding coming in nationally for a diesel to electric retrofits, including a flow money for uh, school buses and yeah. kinds of buses that as well. It can be translated to cheaper. Yeah, well, well uh, for example, what I said about Stuttgart, which is a car city, the car city, I mean, um, they, they have provided um, cheap public transportation, and people use it, and it's simply because, I mean, well, that's a German internal schwab looking at the money. I mean, we have the southern, the Stuttgart are very, um, yeah, very looking at the money. They, they want to, they, <laughs> they don't want to spend a lot, so this is why, uh, why they really um, uh, change their behavior. I think that's one, one part of it. And the other one, after the diesel scandal, we had a lot of these kind of discussions. You just mentioned an emotional debate. Um, it's not a war on cars, but it's um, that people asking themselves, <coughs> do I really need that car? Do I really need that driving that big car? Um, asking the neighbor, why do you are driving an SUV? Why, why do you do that? Um, you, you have a diesel SUV, especially with a diesel, uh, with a diesel scandal. Uh, a lot of these debates happen. Um, but I think it must be that what you said, positive public acceptance and giving good examples, but also the economics to make it, to make it financially more attractive. So I think we have time for one more question, and because we are a university, I just want to ask if there's a student who has a question since we haven't given a chance then yet. Okay, wow, there's so many students. That's very nice to see. <laughs> okay, we'll go on this side of the room. Hi, um, so um, I'm Rohan from Raguha. I work, I'm working with this summer with um, Chelsko and Nof. I go, I'm a spread junior at the University of Chicago. My question is about like regional leadership on, um, on getting people out of cars. So I, I commute to Manhattan every day for my for my work. I live in um I live in New Jersey and I think the only way really to solve to truly reduce the amount of cars is to like reduce is to also work with the regions. What's a good way to marshal support for programs that reduce car usage across the greater region where concerns might be different and where opposition may be greater as well? A few things that come to mind are our RPA, and you know, they gave us a lot in New York City uh, Port Authority as well because they do have that cross state mandate or have been allies when it comes to working on the ports and airports as well. I don't think that's satisfying answer for you to start with that. This is great at this point. Uh, RPA and Port Authority come to mind. I mean, having a regional initiative is something that um, I would personally be interested in for what's worth beyond what's already existing. Well, with that, I think we're at 8 o'clock, and I, I know people probably need to get going, so we'll end here. But thank you all very much. This was tremendously enlightening.